Okay, hello. Welcome to DCRI Research Conference. Yes, the mics are on now. It is. Uh, okay. It's my pleasure to introduce Rajuta Patel. She's in nephrology uh, here in the DCRI. Has been here a year or more. Uh, You've been a in year the and a half. Year okay, and a half. in the DCRI, working in geriatrics and nephrology, and she's covering both of those in her talk today. Falls in geriatric patients with chronic kidney disease. Please. Thank you. So thank you all for coming. Um, you know, I wish Dr. Sedek was here, but she's going to be a mom, and she's going to be try. She'll try and come to my Friday conference because I'm giving the same talk um, on Friday for nephrology grand round. So I'm going to talk about uh, falls in chronic kidney disease. And the reason I find this interesting is when I was a geriatric fellow at the VA, actually, I don't know if some of you work through VA. There's a falls reminder that comes up, and uh, if any of you doesn't like it it's thanks to me and the other geriatric fellows because uh, this was a project that we worked on and we were told up to look up the geriatric literature and come up with questions to create a false reminder to try and prevent falls and they, the thought was that if this is successful the reminder in the geriatric clinic they were going to put it into primary care and other clinics so now actually as a nephrology fellow I do that reminder in fact I did one uh, today it automatically triggers uh, after the age of 65 and you know the initial question is asked by the nurses whether they've fallen in the last year and that also sometimes triggers so either age 65 or uh, the fact that you fell in the last year so that's one thing and then um, you know, I was looking up literature uh, about faults and chronic kidney disease, and what I found was uh, there was really not much literature. There was a lot of literature uh, on faults in dialysis patients, but really not much there in uh, chronic kidney disease. So that's why I decided this would be an interesting topic. Um, so these were, uh, there were several projects that I was working on uh, throughout the year with Dr. Sezek. And, you know, my talk today, I'm going to concentrate on the last one, which is falls in geriatric patients with CKD. And before I start, I wanted to just mention that, you know, those of you that, who don't know, I'm not going to continue clinical research, but what I found is I'm thankful that I had a chance to do clinical research because there are a lot of people out there who think that clinical research is easy. It's not. It is not easy. It, you have to be able to withstand the frustrations, the walls that you hit, go through all the hoops, and then, you know, the outcome may or may not be what you like at the end of it. And so my experience has been you, you need to be really tough to be able to handle that on a day in, day out. So, you know, those of you who pursue careers in clinical research, uh, my hats are actually off to you. Um, and I thought that from my experience that it's almost like one life year is equal to two clinical research years. So at the end of two years, I feel like I've done some clinical research. So that's the analogy I use. Dr. Sezek thinks one um, seven life years is equal to one research year, like dog years. <laughs> anyway, so <laughs> uh, the symbol that you see here is actually, uh, it's a very successful program that was initiated uh, in 1997 in nursing home patients, and it was called to catch a falling star. So what they did was the multidisciplinary team would, uh, you know, identify patients who were at a higher risk of falls and then put a sticker. And some of you may have seen this in hospitals. You know, they're on hospital doors now. Sometimes it's a falling leaf or something else. It's on the chart because dialysis patients we put that on there. So the reason we do this is it uh, makes everybody, you know, including the social worker, the dietitian, the LPN, everybody aware that this person is a higher risk of falls. So they're followed even more closely. So if they find that the person's not using their assistive device, they're not using their wheelchair appropriate, appropriately, it's brought to attention, and so that way we can prevent falls. So why should we worry uh, about a person falling, especially old people? Well, this is based on the geriatric literature that approximately one-third of uh, community dwellers over the age of 65 fall uh, uh, every year, and 10% of these falls actually uh, result in serious injuries. Um, I tried to look at more recent data besides the 2005, but I really couldn't find an aggregate um, uh, number. So this is the latest that I have, that in 2005, the, all false related injuries cost $27.5 uh, billion. Uh, dollars. And the reason 
I think this is important is as nephrologists, uh, I feel that we do a lot of primary care and we're really constrained for time, but just spending a minute or two additionally with the patient can essentially prevent a fall. So a small effort on our end can make huge difference on the other end. So that's one of the reasons I feel that it's extra, it's worth the extra time that we have to spend in clinic. So what are the risk factors for people falling? Well, there are several. These are known from, again, from the geriatric literature. These are four, four or more medications. The reason I've highlighted the number four is in the next slide, I'm going to show you uh, how the odds ratio goes up as the pill number goes up. Uh, of course, if you're older, uh, it's a risk factor. You know, your blood pressure fluctuating is a risk factor. You have problems with your balance and strength. Uh, you can't see properly. Dementia is a risk factor because, you know, they don't know uh, where they are and then they get disoriented, they fall. Arthritis is a risk factor. Again, this is all from the geriatric literature. Certain medications uh, especially are called risk drugs, meaning drugs that make a person more likely to fall. And SSRIs are up there, and I'll show you later on, um, you know, there are studies that in dialysis patients that this is actually uh, one of the biggest risk factors for falls. Uh, benzodiazepines, antipsychotics, TCAs, anticonvulsants, all of these are called risk drugs. So this is the slide I was referring to earlier. What you can see is that uh, Okay. What you can see is that uh, the x-axis has the number of medication and the y-axis is the odds ratio. And if you concentrate on the number four and look up, the odds ratio goes to two. So the box, what I've tried to show is as the pill number goes to four or more, the odds ratio of falling goes up. And when they did the math, uh, actually the p-value is quite significant. So I don't know when I saw last a patient who was on four pills or less, maybe when I did primary care. I, I can't remember uh, the last time, but so four, like nobody's on four medications these days. Um, in this slide, uh, what I'm trying to show is that as the pills, uh, the number of pills that you take goes up, the frequency that you're taking a risk drug, meaning the list of drugs that I showed earlier, which make you fall, goes up. So for example, uh, looking, this, this is a point of the problem. Uh, here, if, if a person's taking one pill, then there's a 25% chance that that one pill is a risk drug, so meaning it could be an SSRI, antipsychotic medication or something that is going to make them fall. However, if you look at six pills, then there's a 60% chance that uh, of those six pills uh, that they're taking half or more of their pills are risk drugs. So again, number of pills going up, the higher the chance that you're taking a drug that's going to make you fall. Uh, this study was actually uh, done in uh, 2005, uh, and the reason I picked this slide was, of course, it was pretty colors and everything. But besides that, what I'm trying to point out here is this is taken from community dwellers. So just people who are living like you and me in the community that divided them into different age groups. So young age group, middle age group, and older age group. Let me see. So what they did for the young age group is if you were 25 to 45, you were young age group. If you were 46 to 65, you were middle age group. And if you're older than uh, 65, you're older. And here in this slide, they're only showing people who fell. So you can see that even young men tend to fall. Middle-aged men fall more, almost double the rate of that young men, and then older men fall at a much higher rate. Uh, and here, what they're showing is young women fall. But look at this. Females, even middle-aged and older, are falling at a much higher rate um, than men. And then, of course, these little colored boxes, you know, they're basically, if there was an injury that was associated with a fall, if the injury required treatment or not, or whether there were fractures. And, you know, just grossly looking at this, women are falling more, they're having more fractures. And this was replicated in another study uh, that was followed by this study in 2009, same thing, that older uh, people fall and females fall. And the reason I'm stressing this out is, and the data that we looked at, we were able to show something similar that older people and women are falling. So just wanted to show that it corrob corroborates with what we know about uh, the general literature. So, well, why should we worry about falls? Well, falls are actually fatal. 
So this was a study um, that was done in Norway, and they looked at about 300 women, and they followed them for a time of uh, nine years. Uh, and what they showed is that at the end of nine years, you know, 40% of women were dead. And based on the calculations they did, they showed that about 30% of women fell once and 20% of women fell twice. And they showed that the females who fair, fell two times or more had a, a relative risk of death, which was 1.6 times likely higher than if you did not fall. So again, same thing that, you know, falls is just not a simple thing. It's a marker of overall mortality. Uh, and this is again based on the geriatric literature. Now, one thing they did not have is they did not have any males. The females were all independently living. The average age was 81 years. And they justified this by saying that, you know, uh, women live longer and uh, they're the higher uh, population that are beyond the age of 75. So I don't know how you can justify but that, but they did not have any males in the study. Okay, so I showed you the risk factors that uh, make uh, old people fall. So what are the risk factors in um, dialysis and kidney patients? Well, they have multiple comorbidities, and I'll show you in, a, in the second slide the number of comorbidities that they have. They have higher incidence of diabetes, um, more heart disease. They have sleep disorders, so sleep apnea. They have diabetes, so they have diabetic neuropathy. They, you know, sometimes they can't feel their feet. Or worse, they may have amputations, and then their prosthesis are not fit, fitting well. Uh, there are multiple fill, uh, pills, and then there's rapid fluid electrolyte shift. So, um, you know, we see it all the time on dialysis patients. If, they're, if we pulled a little bit more fluid, the calculation's off, the blood pressure will be 90 over 60, and then they go dizzy, and then they fall. Of course, electrolyte-wise, you know, low potassium baths can be an issue. So all of these things make them more likely to fall. And, of course, they have all the risk factors that old people have because they have arthritis and all that, and then additionally they have uh, more problems. So this is what I see in kidney clinic most of the time. Like about 75% of my patients walk in with a problem list like that. So, you know, when I look at it, I have to, of course, see which one is the problem, uh, you know, because you have to weed through like 20 problems and their pill list is enormous, you know, and then they're confused about what they're taking, so their list may not match with what they're taking, and I cannot tell you how many times uh, the pills are not renally dosed, so whatever side effects a normal person would have, with their reduced renal function, they're going to have even more side effects. One of them uh, that jumps out is Neurontin. I cannot tell you how many times I've seen Neurontin, they're coming at 1,200 or 1,600 milligram doses when they should not be on more than 600 at best. So in this slide, I just wanted to bring to your attention what we know about dialysis patients. So as you can see, um, this dotted line represents people who are older than 75, and the dark green line uh, represents uh, age 65 to 74. So this group, compared to all these other groups, you know, is the largest uh, population uh, that's growing on dialysis. So basically, uh, you can say that we're dialyzing a lot more old people than we did uh, almost a decade ago. And the median age for dialysis patients, uh, based on the uh, last USRDS data, was already more than 65. And so one argument you could make is, well, we have more old people, so that's why we're dialyzing them. And I will not get into what I think, you know, but my think is, thing is maybe we're a little bit too liberal about dialyzing people beyond a certain age. Like, we have no cutoff. We dialyze people who are 85 who have limited life expectancies. I mean, that's my skewed view. I don't know. Uh, but some European countries, they don't even talk about dialyzing if you're about 85. But I was in service, and we dialyzed a bed-bound nursing home patient who had kidney failure at 85 plus. And so do they all do well? No, they don't do well. In fact, we may be doing more harm uh, than, you know, actually uh, uh, helping them. So this was, I don't know if, how many of you were familiar, but this, this was a very, um, I would say, landmark study in geriatric and uh, dialysis patients that came out last year in the New England Journal of Medicine. And this study was by, let's see, Dr. Manjula Cruella Tamura. And what she did was she looked at nursing home patients, and they looked at about 3,000 nursing home patients, and uh, 
there's a score that you can give these patients based on the minimum data set, which is uh, for their activities of daily living. So the score goes from 0 to 28, and higher the score, more the functional independence the patient has. So what they showed is once the patient was started on dialysis at the end of one year, 58% of these people died, and only 13% of people had the functional capabilities that they did before starting dialysis. And based on that, then they came up with this graph, uh, which is like a simulation of someone who's 75 plus, and what they're trying to show is this, this, this is time zero when dialysis was started. So as you can see, before dialysis, their functional status was pretty good, and after dialysis, it kind of plunges down, and then look at the mortality. It just goes in the opposite direction, skyrocketing. And there was another paper that was an annals that was actually before this a few years ago, but that was a retrospective database they looked at. And again, same thing that showed that if you're 80 or 90 years plus and you were started on dialysis for renal failure, 50% of people died within a year. Now, I'm not saying, you know, of course, each case should be taken on a case basis, but this is just something to keep in mind, that everybody should not be started in dialysis because they don't necessarily do well, and this is a very visual graph, in my opinion. Okay, so uh, that was about dialysis patients. So what do we know about patients with chronic kidney disease? Well, it's a similar trend to what I showed earlier, that over the decades, uh, patients who are older than 60 uh, has been uh, increasing with chronic kidney disease. And based on the latest USRDA data, which was in 2008, if you were older than age 60, then uh, the odd ratio that you were going to have a kidney disease was 6. So same thing. We're having a recurring theme. We have an epidemic of chronic kidney disease. So I showed you that faults are fatal in the geriatric literature. Well, do we have something similar um, in the dialysis literature? Yes. Uh, this was a paper that uh, looked at about 170 uh, dialysis patients, and it was a prospective cohort that was designed uh, to look at these patients between 2002 and 2003. And what they did was they interviewed these patients bi-weekly, and they recorded their faults. And over the end of about 38 months, uh, either the end of the study, which was December 30th, 2006, or the patient died or they received a transplant, that's when they stopped. And what they showed is this dark line is people who never fell, and the gray line is people who did fall. And here, it's you know, this is your time to follow up, and this is the percentage alive. And as you can see, the curves separate out at the end of the time, and this was significant that if you did fall, then you were more likely to die. The p-value was significant, and the hazard ratio was 1.78. So again, falling uh, is fatal even in uh, the dialysis patients. Okay. So the same paper that I showed you, the graph, that uh, paper basically kind of compared how the rate at which the community dwellers fall and that the older dialysis patients fall. So the community dwellers fall at the rate of 0.6 to 0.8 uh, falls per patient year, and the dialysis patients fall at 1.6 falls per patient year. Now, interestingly, I was looking through the literature, nursing home patients actually fall at the same rate, which is 1.6. So essentially what that means is the older dialysis patients are falling as if they're nursing home patients. So that they are that frail. And, you know, the the slide that I showed you previously obviously establishes uh, the fact that if you're going to fall, you're going to uh, die more likely if you're on dialysis. Okay. So it's not a simple matter of just falling and dying. Well, I guess those would be the lucky ones if you fall and die. What we overwhelmingly see is that if you fall, then there's a higher risk of fracture in this patient population. So this paper that I'm referring to actually was in KI. It was in 2000, and they looked at a group of dialysis patients that between 1989 and 1996, and they compared uh, the rate at which their dialysis patients were falling and fracturing to the community dwellers, uh, which was a county in Minnesota, and they showed that um, Half of the dialysis patients who were the age of over the age of 50 uh, had a fracture, and they had a 10 to 40 percent uh, fracture rate compared to the general population. And when they did the math, they were able to show that it was 4.4 times likely than the general population that they were falling and having hip fractures. Now, this is important because these patients have a multiple comorbidity. 
disease. They have diabetes, high blood pressure, uh, coronary artery disease, so they're not going to make good surgical candidates. Even if they go through surgery uh, and they're lucky enough to survive, they're not going to heal well. Uh, you know, because as nephrologists, what we see is we can't treat their bone disease. We, we don't do bone density scans because we're like, well, we don't know if it's renal osteodystrophy or osteoporosis. The only way you can tell is doing a bone biopsy, and we never uh, do that. Plus, if they have reduced EGFRs, we can't um, give them bisphosphonates. So essentially, if you fall and you have a fracture, you're on your own. We have no treatment. So it would be uh, useful to try and just prevent a fall than go through all this because it's just so expensive. The same thing, um, this was a different paper. This was an American Journal of Kidney Disease. And similarly to the other paper, what they showed that the mortality rate was almost the double the rate of the general population in dialysis patients if they had a fracture. However, this study, they showed a hip fracture rate of 17.4 times, which is way higher than the previous paper. And I couldn't find any other paper. So, I mean, like I said, there's literature, but there's, it's like this lack of literature. So, you know, one paper says 4.4 times higher and one says 17.4. So I don't know which one to believe. Um, all I take away is just that they're higher risk of uh, having hip fractures. Okay, so this was the study I was referring to earlier. Uh, so can we really tease out uh, which of the dialysis patients are going to fall? So this was a Belgian study, which was a prospective study, and uh, they looked at about 350 dialysis patients. They approached seven uh, dialysis units, and what they did was they would ask the patient, the family, or the relative of the patient had uh, fallen and then they would record their fractures and the follow-up was uh, for almost a year and the average age of the patient uh, was uh, 71 years and based on the a multivariate analysis, as you can see, what they showed is this is the odds ratio and this is the p-value, that older age, so if you were going to be older, uh, then you were going to fall more. If you had diabetes, you were going to fall more. Total number of drugs. And so here, just to give you an idea, for fallers, the number of drugs was 8.6 plus or minus 3, and non-fallers was 6 plus or minus 2. So there was a significant difference in the pills or, uh, burden in the people who were falling. Um, and like I said, SSRIs, look at the odds ratios, 5.2. And if you remember in the earlier slide, I showed you that SSRI is one of the risk drugs. But, I mean, the, of all the odds ratio, the SSRI has the highest odds ratio of falling. And if you were not able to walk for 10 meters, you imagine, like, 10 meters is nothing. If you can't walk for 10 meters without help, you're more likely to fall. I cannot tell you how many times an outpatient dialysis I've seen they have either AKA or BKA, uh, they're in their wheelchair and they use a hauling thing to bring them in and put them in the chair. Like they can't walk, period. So can you imagine if they go home, how high risk they are for falling? And then of course they're on 25 different pills, which half of them they don't know what they're taking. Okay. So based on all what I've told you, um, this is, was our hypothesis that given the association between falls and mortality amongst elderly patients with and without dialysis, we hypothesized that CKD may also be an independent risk factor for falls. Um, and we thought this was important from public policy point of view because we can put in simple measures and try and uh, prevent fall in this ever-growing uh, uh, population. Uh, what we, uh, our objectives were to identify risk factors for falling among older people with chronic kidney disease, um, to examine the association uh, between hospitalization for falls among elderly patients with CKD and clinical outcomes such as rehospitalization within 90 days, progression to ESRD, and need for long-term care and death. So these were the uh, ICD-9 codes uh, that we were basically going to look at. And th as you can see, we really did not request any codes uh, for CKD stage 1 or 2 because for our clinical purposes, we took an EGFR of less than 60 uh, as being chronic kidney disease. So there were several different codes. We tried to um, make sure that we captured everyone who had proteinuria, hypertension uh, associated with CKD as well. And look how many codes are found when I was looking for codes for fall. It is amazing amount of uh, codes, and I didn't even know that there were these many codes. I don't know how many of these are being used, but some of them I thought were pretty funny. So this one, if you look, if you fall uh, on a sidewalk, then you can use this code. But if you fall from a moving sidewalk, you can't. So I guess if you fall at the airport, you can't use that because they have a moving sidewalk. 
I thought that was funny. And then I thought this might come into handy because, you know, with the summer, a lot of people might be jumping into pools and, you know, you never know. You might need to use that cord. Or if your patient is into rollerblading and skateboarding and snowboarding, might have to use this one. And this I thought was the funniest, that there's a code if someone pushes you and you fall down. Like, literally, there's a code for that. But I'm thinking the, the most common code probably was the, you know, E88.9, which was the unspecified code. But I, I just, I didn't know that there were so many codes just for falling. All right. So uh, we requested the data from uh, USRDS uh, uh, Medicare database from Dr. Paul Eggers. And Dr. Eggers is the program director for kidney and urology epidemiology, National Institute of Diabetes and Digestive and Kidney Disease. You know, I couldn't have remembered that if I wrote, didn't write that down. Um, it contained about 5% of uh, CKD cohort file and 5% of institutional claims for uh, 2006. So by the time we requested this data in 2009, the 2007 data we were told would be available sometime in 2010 by the time I would be done, so that was not possible. And we were actually wanting to get the pills from the Medicare Part D data, but what he said that even if the 2000 data would have the Medicare Part D, he said for whatever reason, he said don't ask, but they're not going to be, they're not going to have the pills or the, the actual uh, names of the pills. I don't know. So we then just decided to go with the 2006 database. So there were 17.5 uh, million observations. Uh, we had about 800,000 patients who had uh, between 1 and 2,500 visits. Um, they had a patient ID, which was each patient was de-identified, uh, their date of visit, um, the diagnosis code, um, which basically classified them as having CKD. Uh, we also had their type of Medicare coverage, the start and the end dates of Medicare, their date of birth, death, uh, sex, rage, uh, which state they lived in, their zip code, and if they happened to start dialysis within that time period, then the date that they did start dialysis. Um, there were about 28 million claims, you know, and with all the different diagnosis codes and service dates, um, we had a huge amount of uh, Part A claims, and that's something that I'm hoping I can, uh, you know, work on later on with Susanna and Karen Pipper, uh, because I think it'll be very interesting to see how, if we have the payment amount, to see if there's a difference uh, between discharge statuses uh, and the cost uh, of uh, the outcomes. Okay, so the patient um, uh, data looks something like this. Uh, we divided the patients into, uh, based on whether they had ever fallen down in the data set in 2006 or whether they never fell down. And then we looked at their age, and as you can see, um, based on this, people who did fall uh, were actually significantly older than people who did not fall. And you can see the uh, median and the uh, range here that I put in. And so this is, again, a recurring theme from what I've told you based on the geriatric literature. And it would make sense that, of course, you know, as you grow older, uh, you are likely to fall more. But it's just something that's there's no literature out there. So it's nice to know that what we're thinking is now there's proof that older people with chronic kidney disease fall more. Okay. So here um, we try to look at the sex and the race. And uh, when you compare the male and the female race, uh, it was found that females are falling at a much higher rate uh, than men. Same thing, uh, you know, what we, uh, I showed you in the uh, geriatric and the uh, community dwellers. And, you know, maybe my biased opinion, but I feel that it's a price to look cute. You know, we grow older, but we like our shoes. So what can I say? We, I, we, we like our heels. Maybe that's why we're falling more. I don't know. We're not clumsy. I know that for a fact. Um, and then looking at the race, uh, of course, the white population uh, was the largest uh, population uh, that was in the data set. But just looking at the raw numbers, it seems as if uh, the white population is falling more compared to the African American population. And then the other races, you know, the numbers are pretty small. And then when an overall p value was done, it was significant, but I really couldn't explain it clinically. Um, but I was told so what it means is that the, I guess what I'll show you later on is the, in the univariate model, is the p value being significant means that 
the distribution of the people who are falling and not falling based on the race is not by chance. So there is, you know, basically a reason uh, dependent on, on race. That's what I was told. So I, I just didn't put it in, but my understanding was that this slide to me, what it means is that white people fall more than black people. Okay. Um, here, we try to divide the people who are falling and non-falling uh, depending on the number of hospitalizations. So their hospitalization could be, they could have no hospitalization, one hospitalization, two, three, uh, four, or six. And then looking at the numbers, you can probably kind of uh, look at the numbers and say people who are falling are likely to be hospitalized more. And again, the p-value overall when it was taken uh, was significant. And, you know, my understanding was I can't explain it uh, that way, but looking at the numbers, what I can tell as a clinician is that people who are falling are, with chronic kidney disease are more likely to be hospitalized. And what was the, another thing that was interesting to me is if you look at the numbers and people who fell and the number of hospitalization, you know, you would think that people who were hospitalized three or more times were more likely to fall, but that's not the case. Even if you were hospitalized once, you were likely to fall and even twice you're likely to fall. So to me, that means there's no clustering of events. So even one hospitalization is a risk factor of, for fall. It doesn't mean that higher the number of hospitalizations, the higher the number of falls. So just to keep that in mind. Um, in this slide, uh, uh, what we tried to show is if you divide the patients based on the different staging of their CKD, some stage uh, one through five, and then look at them, people who are falling versus not falling. Um, just, you know, I guess the p-value was, uh, again, overall for the trend was significant, but I couldn't explain it. But my understanding here, again, was there was no clustering of events, meaning intuitively I think that CKD 4 or 5 are sicker people and that they should fall more compared to CKD stage 1 or 2, but that's not the case. You know, even CKD stage 1 is falling at the, you know, there's pretty much an even distribution between different stages of CKD, whether they're falling or not. So just having uh, CKD, there must be other factors playing into role uh, that is making a person with CKD fall. That's what my understanding was. Okay. Um, here we try to look at um, all the people who were hospitalized um, and divided them uh, into whether they fell or not and then looked at uh, the number of days that they spend into uh, the hospital. And as you can see, you know, we had quite a bit of hospitalizations and hospitalizations that were associated with fall were about uh, 1,264, and then a huge amount of hospitalizations without fall. Um, well, when you look at the number of days they spend in the hospital, if you were hospitalized with a fall, you tended to stay in the hospital much longer compared to someone who was not hospitalized. And again, this is important when you look at the overall cost uh, of the hospitalization. It's expensive. So if something's small on our end that we can do to try and prevent a fall can reduce the days of hospitalization. And you know, from the cardiologist, uh, that's what I hear over and over. Their goal is to keep the patient with chronic heart failure out of the hospital, out of the hospital. So this is what's something we need to pay attention to because our patients are falling more uh, to try and see if we can prevent something and get them out of, or keep them out of the hospital. Because, uh, like I said, if we later on find, you know, look at the Medicare claims aid, uh, 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 numbers and if we actually are able to show that a significant difference between a uh, person who's falling in in the hospital compared to you did not have a fall, then that can be essentially you know money that's saved uh, by preventing something small. Okay, so this is a busy slide, uh, but I want you to concentrate only on the top part. What we tried to do is because we had a date uh, of discharge and discharge location for all of these patients, we divided uh, based on where did they go after their hospitalization. Uh, so there's home, there's long-term care, there's hospice, there's short-term care, and I don't know what this is, discharge or swing bed, I don't know what it is. Uh, and then somebody left against medical advice. Uh, and then look at whether they were hospitalized with a fall or without a fall. So what you can see here is if you were hospitalized with a fall, 20% of these people went home and you were hospitalized without a fall, 43% people 
uh, went home. So what that means is that if you were hospitalized without a fall, you were more likely to go home. And then looking at the second um, uh, set of numbers, you can see that if you were hospitalized with a fall, then you are more likely to be discharged to a long-term care facility uh, compared to home. So, and these values are statistically significant. So again, same thing, that if you fall and you're hospitalized, uh, you're more likely to go to long-term care, which again is more expensive. And this last one about hospice and death, I am not sure how to explain that because the p-value is significant. I spoke with Susanna and you know, our thought process was that because this number was so small, the hospitalizations would fall, and this sample was so huge, that's why we got the p-value. And so based on this, all I can tell you is based on this data, what we're seeing is that if you have chronic kidney disease and you fell, death is not one of the outcomes. That's all I can say. So the previous data that I showed actually was the raw data. So there were several patients, almost 100,000 patients, that had uh, between 1 and 29 hospitalizations. So that means each patient could have been counted 2, 3, 4, 5, or 10 times. This data is the clean data. So basically each person is taken and accounted for only once. And I thought this was more important to me because what it shows is what was shown in the previous slide because even though the numbers, uh, number of patients have gone down, same thing, that if you did fall, then uh, you were more uh, likely, I mean, sorry, excuse me, you were less likely to go home. And if you did fall, then you were more likely to go to long-term care. And this is the same thing, death and hospice. I can't explain. All I can say is if you fell, uh, it's not associated with death. But I, I thought that to me, this was more important than the previous slide. All right. So this is the, the univariate predictors for fall. And uh, you know we have the odds ratio, the confidence limits, the chi-square, and the p-values. Um, so basically, if you're older, uh, then you're more likely to fall. And then when you look at the sex, you know, this odd ratio is less than one. So what it tells me is that if you're a female, more, you're more likely to fall. As a male, you're less likely to fall. And then when you look at the race, each race is compared uh, with the Caucasian race, that Asians and blacks are less likely to fall when compared to the white race. Uh, and the white race is the race of reference. And when the Native Americans are compared, they have a a very high odds ratio, and I don't know how to explain that, but it's just that one race uh, is falling much more when compared to the white. And then when you take out all the races and you just use other, um, you know, your odds ratio is still uh, basically the same as the black and the Asian. So, you know, any other race is falling less than the white, and the white was a comparison group. And, you know, you can see the p-values here that are statistically significant for each. So here we try to compare the different um, stages of CKD uh, with ESRD. And to me, this box is the most important. What it tells me is that the odd ratio, whether you see CKD 5 or 1, is pretty much the same when compared to the dialysis patients. Of course, the dialysis patients are falling more than uh, the CKD patients. But like I said earlier, uh, intuitively, I would have thought that CKD 4 or 5 are sicker and they should be falling more, but that's not the case. So that just kind of confirms you know, what I showed earlier, that just even stage 1 or 2, uh, you know, so it's uniform distribution of the odds ratio for different stages of CKD. Um, this slide, uh, we just, you know, took all the patients who had CKD, ASRD, just divided them uh, into whether they fell or not. It didn't matter whether they were hospitalized or not, just like a raw, and then look at the p-value, and the p-value uh, is non-significant. What this tells me is essentially that dialysis patients and CKD patients are very similar. So even though we have a huge sample size of CKD patients and a much smaller patient population of ESRD, the p-value being non-significant means that uh, I should essentially clinically treat uh, dialysis patients and CKD patients similar manner when it comes to falls. So if I'm going to do something to prevent falls in a ESRD patients, I should probably put in same policies uh, for ESRD patients. So that, that, that's what I took, a, took away from um, this table. Oh, sorry. So, and this, and so the other thing I wanted to point out in this slide is if you actually look at the numbers, you know, the actual numbers, um, you, you can say, well, so the patients who did fall in both groups were less than 2%, so who really cares, you know? 
but given all the changes that we're going to go through and for nephrology, most of our funding comes from Medicare and you know Medicare is going through huge overhauling and uh, starting January 1st, 2011, we're going to get a composite bundle rate for each patient so we can no longer bill for separate medications like we're doing right now. This is important because it's a small chunk of patients. So, uh, you know, dialysis patients cost uh, out of the $355 billion that Medicare spent last year, uh, dialysis patients uh, were about $35 billion. So, you know, the government's looking how much it costs to dialyze each patient. And if they're going to make changes in slash, you know, this is the small patient population that is, you know, driving the costs up. So as of last year, to take care of a dialysis patient, just to dialyze them uh, for one year was expensive. Any, anybody have an idea of roughly how much it costs just, just to dialyze your patient once for one year? Just do hemodialysis. Just throw out a number. Just random number. Come on. Somebody, just throw a number. Exactly, there you go. So can you imagine one patient, and you know how many patients we have? We have close to 400,000 patients who are on dialysis currently, and the number's rising every day. So $75,000 to take care of one dialysis patient, and I'm not talking about the times they were hospitalized. I'm not talking about how many times they were hospitalized for infections, for perm cats, uh, for you know, long-term care facilities. It's expensive. So this uh, next slide, I just wanted to give you a visual uh, based on the latest USRDS database that, as you can see, um, to take care of hemodialysis patient has, over the decades, got expensive uh, over time. And then I'm not going to go into this, but PD patients cost uh, about $20,000 less per year. And of course, transplant is the way to go, but we don't have enough kidneys. And so that's one of the other things that I'm thinking what's going to happen is uh, government is not stupid. They know that PD patients cost less. So they're going to say, then why are we dialyzing? Why are we the nation with the highest number of hemodialysis patients in the country? Why are we not doing PD? So but that's a whole different discussion. I think, you know, there's going to be shift towards PD more because it's just so expensive to take care of uh, hemo patients. So, um, this was a Kaplan-Meier curve that Susanna was gracious enough to do at the last minute when she realized what I was trying to tell her after multiple <laughs> conversations. She was very patient with me. Uh, and so what she has tried to do here, let's see if I can get this correct. What she has tried to do here is this is a cumulative distribution curve and is limited to people who were discharged from a hospitalization before July 4, 2006. So after their discharge, she looked at how many of those people fell after their hospitalization. Uh, did I say that right? Oh, about right? Okay. So, uh, you know, if you, if you look at this curve, you can see that this is days following hospitalization. And, of course, this is people who everybody... All of these patients uh, fell after hospitalization, so that's why, you know, as time goes by, it almost reaches 100%. But what's important is that when you look at the median, uh, you know, you look at 50% um, uh, uh, patients, they fell, their median time to fall was 79 days. So basically, clinically, to me, what this tells me is that if you're going to be discharged from a hospital, between two to three months, there's a high likelihood that you're going to fall. Cause Based on this, I can say, well, 50% of people who uh, have chronic kidney disease are going to fall between two and three months. So maybe if they come to me, see me in clinic at week uh, five or six, I'll just pay a little bit more attention to their medications, you know, look at their medications if they're really, really dosed, if, they, you know, if they're using the walker or whatever, because to me, the, this is like the high risk period that they're going to fall. And here, uh, what she tried to do is um, she separated, so this dashed line uh, is the line uh, of people who had a fall before or at the hospitalization. And she, then she looked, compared them, so that graph with this graph, which is people who fell only at their hospitalization. And what she was able to show is that if you had fallen before that particular hospitalization, you fell again within 56 days. Uh, and if you had never had a fall, uh, you fell at about 80 to 82 days after the hospitalization. So, uh, and you know, the p-value is significant, but to me clinically what this means is if you've fallen in the past, there's a high likelihood that you're going to fall again. And I showed you that the number of hospitalizations doesn't matter. Even one hospitalization is a risk factor. So, and this is already known from the geriatric literature that having had a previous fall is the highest risk factor for falling again. 
So this just, you know, confirms what we know uh, into chronic kidney disease patients that, you know, if you've had a previous fall, you're going to fall again and quicker. Okay. So the conclusions uh, that uh, we can draw uh, based on what I've shown you is that people who are older are falling more, uh, women are falling more, um, Native Americans when they're compared to whites are falling more, um, black and Asian are falling less when they're compared to the whites, uh, patients who fall are hospitalized more. Um, there's no clustering of falls within the number of with the number of hospitalizations. So even one hospitalization is a risk factor for fall. And fallers and non-fallers are very similar through different stages of CKD. Um, so it's not that stage four and five are falling more compared to stage one. Just having CKD one through four, you know, it's very similar. Your risk for falling is very similar. Uh, patients who fall uh, tend to stay in the hospital for a longer time, and like I said, it would be interesting to find out the cost, you know, it really show the cost difference. Uh, if there's no fall associated with the hospitalization, then the patient is more likely to be discharged home, and if there is a fall associated with the hospitalization, then you're more likely to be discharged to long-term care facility. Um, CKD and ESRD patients are very similar uh, in terms of when you just look at falls, whether or not they were hospitalized. Um, after discharge from a hospitalization, 50% of patients with CKD fall within two to three months uh, of their discharge. Uh, if a patient has had a previous fall, then they're at a higher risk of falling again. And that's it. So I wanted to thank Dr. Sazek. I couldn't have done this without her. She believed in me because she was just like, do what you feel like, what you like, think about it and come to me. And then, you know, Susanna has been like the backbone. I don't know how many times I've called her and I'll be like, do you have a minute? And I don't know, maybe she didn't have a minute, who knows, but she was always kind and gracious to spend time with me and talk to me. And Karen has just been fabulous, you know, she's so busy, but she's always had time to meet we, with me and Dr. Sezek and, you know, kind of instrumental in what we're thinking, whether it makes sense or not statistically, because <laughs> just because we want to do it doesn't make, mean it makes sense. Uh, and Linda is, uh, you know, the secretary, Dr. Sezek's secretary. She's helped me a lot because I had a lot of trouble trying to get the data from USRDS. Uh, I'm not going to go into details, but it was a headache. It took me three months before I got the data, and she helped me out a lot. And Jason is one of my uh, co-fellows. He Helped me out. He looked at the slides and you know made some suggestions, which I thought were really helpful. And that's it. Thank you. <laughs> Questions? So that was very interesting, and I'm, I'm trying to put this all together. Maybe is Karen here? Oh, good. <laughs> maybe, maybe you'll help me understand a bit. Um, it seems to me that. It, it, and it seems somewhat intuitive that if you're old, you fall more than mm -hmm. if you're not old. Right. Um, and then if you fall, you don't do so good. Right. That seems like it makes sense. But what else do we know about, because it's sort of one way I could look at this is who cares? I mean, it's, it's a bad problem and they don't do well, but what if we can't do anything about it? Who really cares? So then I want to try to understand it a bit more. Mm -hmm. And what else do we know about people that fall? So in the data, do we know that, for example, there's a higher prevalence of diabetes? Do we know anything about um, other comorbidities like hypertension? The kind of things you might think of as people with chronic kidney disease have hypertension and diabetes. Is this people who are hypoglycemic? Is this people who take too many antihypertensives? Is this people with heart failure who are volume depleted? What else can we understand in the data that's available absent the medicines? Mm -hmm to try to understand who the fall population is. And then once you know that, what's the next steps in terms of trying to understand through the data that you have what might be the opportunity to do something? Okay. So I don't know about, uh, you know, whether we uh, have looked at the comorbid conditions. We so have you created multivariable models to right. try to understand who, you know, just big categories, falls, no mm -hmm. falls? So, <laughs> so help me understand who, who falls and who doesn't fall. Well, I mean, watch the fellows stumble around here. They fall too, but I want to, you know, I want I, I to know, you know, what are the diseases? What, what makes people fall other than just being an old geezer? 
But the one thing to, to remember is, is the denominator here was people with CKD. Correct. And so it's already biased around the sort of the broader issue. You know, being able to separate out diabetes, hypertension is going to be a challenge. So I, my, my, question was, my question was really similar. I mean, I may have missed it, but it seems to me that you're talking about falls in CKD patients, but I, didn't, I don't think I saw a multivariable model that said, does CKD itself add an, in, is, is it an independent predictor after you control for diabetes, amputations, and all the other, the number of uh, antidepressant medications, et cetera, that, you know, looking at all these series of univariate analyses is not very informative to answer the fundamental question. Right. I mean, I wasn't clear through this whole thing whether CKD itself is truly a risk factor or you're just dealing with a population that has all these other risk factors. Right. Right. It's just traveling yeah. with the others. Yeah. Right. Right. Um, I hate to do this to you, Susanna, but I, I, I didn't realize till this morning that this talk was taking place, and so I am not at all prepared for any of these questions, and Susanna was the one who analyzed it. And Susanna, I am so sorry to do this to you, but I'm going to ask you if you can answer these. I know. <laughs> um, well, to answer the comorbidity question, we don't have any of that data. We have um, diagnosis codes. So I guess potentially somebody could go through and say this diagnosis code, this diagnosis code, this one correspond to this, and, and try to come up with some comorbidities <laughs> from the diagnoses. Um, and then the other question was, yeah, this is... And, and that's, that's the way it's typically done with the claims data is you just, because people are going to carry those diagnoses, with, especially with the hospitalizations. So one could do that. And then for the other question, this sample is all CKD, so we don't have any data from non-CKD patients to see if CKD patients are more likely to fall than other patients. And I think one of the things we, you're absolutely right. So one of the so there's literally, as of uh, the PubMed search that I did last week, there's no literature on CKD and faults. So you're right. Intuitively, it would make sense. So yes, you're all little. But like I showed in the slides earlier, you know, we have literature that dialysis patients falling or dying, but we don't have any literature at all, even though the CKD population is much bigger than the dialysis population, what happens in faults. And yes, I think that's a very good idea to look at the codes, but one of the things we're able to kind of show, and it makes intuitively sense, but to show that you fall with chronic kidney disease, you're longer in the hospital, you know, f females are falling. So it's kind of reiterating what we know, what we think, yeah, but, but, but putting it down and saying this is it. This is what we've actually showed. That was one of the things. Yeah, but we're, we're not showing that people do fall more with CKD right. because in this thing we have only right, CKDs. Right, exactly. So because we don't have a comparison group uh, to look at. Now, so what we can essentially say is that based on this, we need more studies and not look at the retrospective database, but do a more prospective study and tease out those questions. Be I think this is really important stuff. It's actually pretty interesting. And, uh, you know, it's sort of like a lot of things that common problems that seem sort of pedestrian are actually pretty important from a public health perspective. So I applaud you guys doing this. I just want to make sure we're doing it the right mm -hmm. way. Um, and that w because ultimately what you'd like to do is get to a point, again, where you're not saying, oh, who cares? You're right. saying who cares because these are all patients with diabetes and maybe some of that would set off, our, uh, you know, some exploration into hypoglycemia or maybe mm -hmm. it's people with hypertension and it would set off an exploration into people, you know, being overtreated for the right. hypertension. So I, I just want to make sure we do it the right, right. way and creating no. multivariable models to understand who are in the two categories I mm -hmm. think is sort of one of the key first steps to understand right. who these people are. We, just to add to that, we can do that. I think that one of the issues that we had was the, my brain's starting to kick in now, is that we realized that we did have a biased sample. We had only one specific type of sample. So, and we are limited in how much we can model because it is claims data. So, I mean, we can do, so, so we wanted to be careful not to go so far as to make people think that we knew the answer. We wanted to try to keep it on a more descriptive level to have this be a, a, a study that would lead somebody else to do the study that needs to be done. Mm -hmm. As long as we define all of that, I'm okay with that. Yeah. As, as, right. 
So I had a question about uh, sort of corollary of this is sort of going to the so what question. Um, you show, and I mean, it makes intuitive sense that if you fall, you are more likely to uh, end up in long-term care, which is a huge issue. Um, and you started out with a sample of people who were still living independently at home. Is, is that correct to say, or do you not know? No, we don't know if they were living at home before uh, they came in. We don't know. So, that. so to me, that would be a huge question. Um, Again, the huge, yeah. an incredible question here is that if you whether you if you were if you came from home and were discharged to long-term care based on based on your discharge uh, diagnosis. That is the, uh, the 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 real interesting thing here because if you're uh, if you are not independent anymore after you've fallen, then the pre the the care that you need to take before somebody makes it to the first hospitalization becomes really critical. Right. If these patients are already in a depend independent living, fall there and go into hospitalization and they are discharged to long term care, then your whole shift also in your cost picture totally right. shifts. So that's one of the limitations because this data is a snapshot in time. It's like just one year, 2006. It's a claims data. It's ICD-9 code, so we don't know whether they were coming from home or not. We just know where they were discharged after their hospitalization. So the question that you're raising is exactly what Karen said, that somebody needs to do more prospective studies. So because how come we don't have any study? Forget about retrospective. This is like just looking at a database. How come we have no studies, not even prospective or retrospective? Perspective, but that's what needs to be done following here that you know they need to look at patients who have CKD and it needs to be followed where they were before their hospitalization and then follow them through and see whether a fall led to long term care or uh, home. So again, that needs to be just like the Belgian study that I showed. It needs to be followed up. It needs to be a perspective study. Pick a sample size, uh, patients who are older than 65, CKD, and then see what happens. But with a retrospective or a data like this, um, those are the limitations. Adrian, can't you get at some of this uh, non-CKD patients through the uh, through the Medicare data? Yeah, there are a couple of ways. So one is. Um, <coughs> So there's um, uh, so there are a couple different ways. So one is a 5% national sample, so it includes all patients who mm -hmm. uh, have um, Medicare, uh, and it's selected based on Social Security uh, number, essentially the last four, uh, first three in terms of random sample. <clears throat> so that's one way. Um, it's more geared for inpatient um, care, uh, mm -hmm. but you can also link that to outpatient treatments. Uh, second uh, consideration here is that there are some other administrative claims databases that uh, have uh, that are in younger patients, so United Healthcare, that also have this. And then if you go back, um, you can also look back in time, so more than one year, to see if they've ever been hospitalized or where their uh, admission source was when they got hospitalized to identify whether that came from a facility or not. Uh, so there are a couple and, different. And one of the things that we were limited by was cost. Uh, you know, th th seriously, this this by itself was twenty five hundred dollars just to get for one one year state five oh, percent. <laughs> yeah, no, no, and certainly you can add a zero to that for uh, use of these other things. That's twenty. That's actually really. And right. So uh, I mean, so when we got the initial bill, then we had to cut down, and that's why that's you're right. We were looking at the whole five percent Medicare, and then we got the bill, and I was like, oh my god. And up till uh, Patel, who's not here, uh, so I can disclose this. Um, he actually has a, um, a K award around some of this uh, that's more focused on uh, quality of care, um, but actually hired uh, recently. A, a programmer with uh, administrative claims background, and so they're using claims databases for some of his work, and so he may be a good contact as well. So, okay, well, this is a great discussion. Thank you all very much. Let's thank you. Thank you, Judah. Again.